Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. Today I'm about to visit Boston Metal who are developing molten oxide electrolysis, a new process for making steel without CO2 emissions. Steel manufacture is responsible for about 8% of global CO2 emissions. And I did a recent video on this and talked about how steel is traditionally made and what the options are to reduce emissions with new processes like the one that Boston Metal is working on. We've been making steel kind of roughly the same way for thousands of years and there have been a lot of advances over the past couple of hundred years, but it remains typically a really big, noisy, dirty process. So it's a little bit strange to be entering this nice, clean business park to see Boston Metals process. When I go in, we're going to get to see how the process works and talk a lot about the different stages of their technology development and how that's progressing for them. Boston Metal was founded over a decade ago in 2010 when MIT professors Donald Saddleway and Antoine Eleanor first demonstrated lab scale performance of a metallic inert anode for molten oxide electrolysis. By now, 12 years later, they're at the point of building their first commercial kind of scale pilot line. And according to their projections, they'll be ready for commercial deployment in 2026. So what have they been doing over the past 12 years and what are the challenges left to solve over the next four? For me, the opportunity to ask these questions is one of the main reasons why I was so keen to make this video. So much reporting on new technology and especially on new clean technology, brand new lab scale developments, kind of like at the stage where Sadaway and Eleanor were at in 2010. And you often get the impression from these reports that it's like the shiny new technology solution to all our climate problems is pretty much a done deal. But developing a new industrial process and all the equipment that goes with that is just not fast. In Boston Metals case, like with many other clean energy and climate change related technologies, they're using new science, they're developing new engineering and they're working with large manufacturing equipment. So this is obviously very different to what you might think of when you think of like a stereotypical startup. I have a mental image of two university kids in a garage wearing hoodies, you know, coding. The kinds of technology that Boston Metal and many of the key tech startups of the energy transition are working on, um, they involve hardware and incorporate new science or engineering. These types of technologies are sometimes called deep tech or hard tech, and their problems are so different to ones that can be solved with an app and a clever business plan. So let's go inside and see what they're up to in here. We're gonna find out about how Boston Metal's molten oxide electrolysis process works and find out about the technology development process that started over a decade ago in MIT. Good morning. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Come on in. We're going to see the first four stages of Boston Metal Scale Up, which takes the technology from a 0.01 kiloamp lab scale reproduction of that original MIT work that can make just a few grams a day, all the way up to a 25 kiloamp multi anode cell, which will make hundreds of kilos per day. First up, R&D materials engineer Manisha showed me what they're working on in the lab. I was unfortunately not able to show footage of what I saw in the lab, but Manisha is going to explain what are they learning from their lab experiments. Oh, we're learning a lot of different things, like how the electrode reacts to our uh, very molten liquid pool of metal, which is at very high temperature. Yeah. Uh, we do a lot of iterations in the lab to get our efficiency going up, to amount of iron that we produce, to amount of oxygen that we produce, that directly correlates with the amount of iron we produce. So what is the experimental setup to achieve that? And how does the molten oxide electrolysis process work? So it's a very small lab cell. It's very controlled environment. It's externally heated lab cells that the temperature will go up to 1600 and more. This is our, what we call as anode or the working electrode. So the working electrode and the counter electrode goes in and there is an oxidation and reduction that happens in the cell that actually makes us able to produce iron. On the anode side, it, all it does is produce oxygen, which is why our uh, process is CO2 free, because we are in any of this process, nowhere carbon is involved. All we are doing is producing oxygen. So that small cell needs to be externally heated, but the electric current that provides the electrons for the electrochemical reaction can also provide enough thermal power to maintain the process temperature. So the next step for Boston Metal was to scale up to a self-heated semi-industrial cell at 0.25 kiloamps. And we also scale up from just a few grams per day in the lab cell to several kilos per day at the 250 amp semi-industrial cell. 
And now onto the first bit of equipment that I was allowed to film. Operations engineers Heather and Karina are going to show us the next scale up, a larger semi-industrial cell, this time to 25 kiloamps, and that can process tens of kilos per day. This is our 25 kiloamp molten oxide electrolysis cell. It's effectively a giant furnace, lots of layers of insulation, and then inside is where the magic happens. Uh, we load it with a mixture of electrolyte, which is oxides, and then dissolve the iron oxide in it. When we run the current through, that's when the electrolysis happens. It separate, separates the oxygen from the iron. The iron settles to the bottom and is relieved out this tapping hole right here. And the oxides stay in there and allow us to continue doing the process. So we run current top through to the bottom and that's how our process works. We have two ports up at the top and human operators will open up one of the ports and feed a predetermined amount of iron ore into the cell, close it up. We tend to feed approximately hourly, but sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the experiment. We've been using MacFine's iron ore at the moment, um, but we are able to use almost like the leftovers from the mining industry. So it's actually useful. We don't require a certain grade of ore. We can use the left behind that no, no one else can really use. So this is a really efficient process that way. Part of the step of this is to kind of finalize the process that was begun in R&D. Yeah. So we are, it's not only the scale up, but it's also to make sure that the process is working and that we can reuse it. So, but now we've gotten to a semi-industrial process and I think the most significant step up from the 0.25 kiloamp cell was the ability to tap the steel. But still, this process can only make tens of kilos per day, which is nowhere near industrial volumes. So now Senior VP of Technology, Stefan, is going to show us the next scale up that they're working on now, which is a 25 kiloamp industrial cell that can make hundreds of kilos per day. Still not an industrial volume, but we're getting much closer. So inside, we have a lot of refractories, we have the inner anodes. We basically make iron that is accumulating on the bottom to give it a meaningful tap of volume. We accumulate that inside the cell and then you see the double tap hole. This would be then the, uh, the tap hole for the iron. We drill the tap hole and then we tap an amount of iron. Then the liquid level comes down. The control system will regulate the anodes down as well because it has a particular distance inside that it maintains. So then, yeah, we uh, extract an amount of metal in an amount of time that is then the production. Now, we close it then up again and uh, the process then continues. In the meantime, on the top, we have a uh, feeding system. There's a hopper with iron ore and then the iron ore is distributed inside the cell, dissolves in the molten electrolyte and then is ready for the electrochemical reactions. The electrolyte receives the gang material that's non-iron. And over time, we also need to tap, ex we call it excess electrolyte or slag. And we do that in the upper tap hole because that liquid layer inside is on the high side so that we can separate two clean phases of uh, liquid. So then we tap periodically a little bit of that material and then put it aside for recycling. So this is how we use the, the tap holes. And this is a spare one. And this is standard uh, tap hole technology that uses in blast furnaces or cupolas or other types of furnaces. To scale an electrolysis process, there's a few parameters involved, but the main one is the electric current, the DC current that's passing through the cell. So this is an, uh, a logical step in scaling the technology up to the next level. This is the stepping stone to get to 200 kA, which is the first industrial application. That's the next after this one. In the world of aluminum smelting, there are thousands of cells operating today at 200 kA level. That means that we can take the same infrastructure of power systems, bus bars, feeding systems, etc., without any risk. So that's the first big scale up. Now, 200 kA is not the final point. Uh, where we really, from a productivity point of view and the best cost efficiency point of view, you want to aim for even up to 600 kA. Now that is uh, proven in the aluminum industry. So this is where we're aiming right now for the best efficiency, the biggest plan. So one smelter uh, at 600 kA can produce 1.5 million tons of iron per year. It's exactly what an iron and steel company needs. They need a technology that can deliver at one, one and a half million, maybe even bigger than that, because blast furnaces operate at those levels. So if we want to re replace blast furnaces or similar technologies like that, you cannot come with a small technology. You have to come with the right tools to the table. 
So you're building this one at the moment. When will this be ready? Um, so this is an advanced stage. Um, in about two months, this should be fired up. And then um, uh, we will run it uh, for about two more months. And then another upgrade will be done by the end of the year. And then next year, we have a full program set up really to demonstrate at this platform and get the data, the experience and, and all the learnings for the, we call it the demonstration project or the first industrial plan. So we have already started working on the demonstration project because it takes three years to develop. So even though this one is not operational yet, we already are thinking of that project because we don't want to wait too long and we can do many things in parallel. So like an engineering company is already working on the design and the costing, and it allows us to sit down with some steel companies to explain our project, to interest them in our project, and to actually build it on one of their facilities so that we can operate it, although it's a small scale, but in parallel with their current steel making processes. Now, the advantage of that is that the iron that you make can be used in that plant and tested. We can tap in the infrastructure that's already there, use some of the operators. The compromise is, is that what you created now is most likely not economical yet because the cell is too big, conservative. There's a, it really needs to go on a diet so that ultimately when we scale it up in a commercial plant, it's much cheaper because the capital cost is a tremendous factor later on for the steel makers to make sure that it is attractive to them. Because yeah, it's not just zero CO2, it has to have the right price tag as well. That was a really cool tour and I need to give a big thank you to Boston Metal for allowing me that access. I couldn't film everything that I wanted to, but compared to other companies at this stage of technology development, I do really appreciate that they gave me a lot more access than I probably would have expected. So there were some really interesting things there. We saw like four different stages of prototype basically for their technology. It's taken them 12 years uh, to get to the point now where they're ready to start developing it commercially. And I think over the next four or maybe eight years, that's where we're gonna see really the commercial development in the future. It's gonna be much more about how can we make this economically attractive way to make steel. Um, whereas the main scientific uncertainties have already been solved. Big thanks to my Patreon community. They support all of the videos that I make. They gave me some great questions ahead of time to cover in this video. So if you would like to join us, then I'll put a link in the description. Um, you can join us, get access to the Discord channel and just generally hang out with a like-minded group of energy nerds and chat all things about the energy transition with respect to engineering. Thanks everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next video.